morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Charleston Wesley United Methodist Church. How many of you have already been to a baseball game this, this season? A few of you, good. Uh, baseball fans, yes. Um, I, m my most memorable baptism, perhaps ever, uh, I kid you not, I, I had the, was going to baptize this baby girl, and I asked the father, I said, well, what's her name? And, and he said, Brixen, and it's B-R-I-X-E-N. I said, what's her middle name? And he said, Ivy. Her name was Brixen Ivy. He was a diehard Cub fan, and he wanted to memorialize that in the life of his daughter. So I baptized Bricks and Ivy, and, and uh, it will always stand out in my memory. But you know, baseball, it's the time of, of the year for, for baseball kicking up, and, and um, sometimes it's fun to look at uh, one area of our lives through the lens of another. And whenever we look at our following Christ through the, some other lens, sometimes it gives us insight. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, for this month as we use baseball as the lens to look at our following of Christ. So, um, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us as we gather to worship you today. We thank you for the many ways that you're involved in each one of our lives and for the fact that you want to use us for the furthering of your kingdom on this earth. Help us to understand our unique role in that process and draw us close to yourself, even as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we worship. Please join me in the morning prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, thank you for the new life that you came to give to us through Jesus Christ. We gather as your people in this place of worship and to worship you and encounter you. Draw us near to yourself. We hear your word that you are making all things new. May that be the true in each of our lives. Renew our hearts and minds. Rekindle a love for you in our hearts that compels us to love and serve you and others in Christ's name. Give us your grace that we might grow in you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. You can follow us in your Bible. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Well, again, I want to welcome you this morning to worship, and I'm really glad that you're here. My name is Bob Swickard, the pastor. And um, in your bulletin, as you walked in, I'm guessing you got a bulletin, and inside there is a little making connection card. And if you'd sign that for yourself, and for those that are worshiping with you, you can put this in the offering plate when it comes by in just a few moments. And uh, I want to, we've got some special announcements today for you to be aware of, and so I want to invite Janice Call. Um, Janice is our pastor of congregational care, and uh, she has a very special announcement this morning. There are two announcements that I'd like to make, and they both deal with uh, something that's going on this Saturday here at the church. The first is at 10 o'clock, those of you that are a part of the basket ministry are asked to be here, and we're going to get our baskets made and ready for uh, uh, being dedicated this next Sunday, and then we'll take them around uh, to the people uh, who will be the recipients of those. So if you're a basket person, if, or if you would like to be and help us, it doesn't take us very long to, uh, to fill those baskets and get them ready for delivery and uh, get them to put where they need to be uh, for dedication. But that's at 10 o'clock, and that will be in the parlor. And then at 1030, we are going to, to teach anyone who would like to come and, and make of themselves a, a new wardrobe of clothing uh, and other things to meet us at 1030. It's in, um, I believe it's room 113. It's the room next to the Boy Scout room that uh, joins the fellowship hall. So when you come in, just go to the fellowship hall and you'll find the door that's open. And there are some people there that are gonna teach us to crochet. Now we're not diving for pearls yet. We're not doing knits and pearls, but we are crocheting. You do not need to bring anything except yourself and let us know that you're coming so that we can, we have plenty of yarn. We just have tons of yarn. Um, but, and we want to be sure that we have enough uh, crochet hooks to give to you to do them. There are things like crosses, bookmarks, and the prayer squares that you've seen that we've taken around, the, the uh, prayer shawls, this is a baby blanket. Uh, you can make hats for the winter uh, as we take around uh, to, to those people, to children and so forth in the winter that need caps during the winter and scarves. There are a lot of things that you can do to learn to do for yourself but then there are a lot of things that you can do to help our ministry here at Wesley to help others. And if, if you're like me and you learned from your aunt when you're six or seven years old to crochet, um, then uh, it's been a long time since I was six or seven. And my, the, 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 the uh, time has changed and it's probably a lot easier to do, I'm sure, than it was when I was that age. But I have a hard time remembering exactly what I, when I, I can knit, I can crochet on and then when I, and I can get the first row, and then I'm not real sure when, I, when you get the next row, whether you put through one or two. Those of you crochet know what I'm talking about. But if you want to learn to crochet, um, we have some people who are going to be willing to teach you, and you can make all kinds of things. We would love to have you apart. Like I say, you don't need to bring anything but yourselves. If you would sign your name, though, that you're interested in coming, we already have some people who have signed up. Uh, plus, I think some have, have signed up this at, this morning, but we want to be sure that we have enough crochet hooks. So if you're interested in coming, please come and meet us uh, to, uh, this Saturday at 1030. And uh, I thank you for this time uh, to show off my Easter garb. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Janice. 
Also, I hope that you'll look through your announcement sheets in your bulletin because there are many things that are going on. There's some new opportunities coming up, um, opportunities to grow and study, uh, opportunities to serve, and we hope that you'll look through that. Um, also, b- uh, before our last announcement, I just wanted to um, remind everyone, uh, how many of you have taken the survey uh, so far? Uh, if you've taken the survey, okay. Um, if you haven't taken the survey yet, hopefully many of you received a link from Rosalie Addison in the church office uh, that had that link in it. Uh, you can take the survey that way. You can also go on uh, the church's Facebook page. That's usually the best way to get to it, uh, is through Facebook, and, and take the survey there. It'll take you not very long to fill out, uh, but I just wanted to remind you um, that this coming Wednesday is when we're going to close that off. So if you haven't had a chance to take it, if you would please do it in the next three days, uh, that would be great. If you don't have access to a computer, you can pick up a hard copy in the church office, and you can fill it out while you're standing there if you like, um, and, and that's another way to do it. Uh, also, on, uh, on one of them, it'll say, you know, you'll notice that it limits you to 50 characters, and, um, and, and basically what's behind that is, um, for example, one of the questions is, do you have a dream for Wesley? Um, what would that dream be? Like, what direction would you point for your dream? Is it a new children's ministry? Um, then new children's ministry. Is it reaching the poor? Then write reaching the poor. Is it new music or new worship or whatever it is? Um, we're looking for big banners um, because there are so many different directions, of course, that the church could go. So that's, um, that's kind of the, what's a little behind the... Uh, the, the 50 characters. If you haven't had a chance, I hope that you'll do it before Wednesday because we're going to um, close that survey then. Tori, uh, would you come up? Tori Wilson uh, has one last announcement. It's a big one because uh, we have some real important things coming up in the life of young people and adults in service. Good morning. Um, next week, we leave for ASD already. It feels like we were just here reflecting on last year's trip. Um, next Sunday, June 12th, we leave at 4.30, between 4.30 and 5 in the morning to head to Huff Creek, West Virginia. Um, it's, it's, we're going into uncharted territory, you know, we're, we're, we've been very comfortable in Kentucky, and um, when we talked with ASP this year, they said, we really need people in West Virginia, and, and I said, well, but we really like Kentucky, and, and they said, well, we really, really need people in West Virginia, and so we're, we're going to West Virginia, and, and I feel like, um, God led us there for a number of reasons. One, it is out of our comfort zone, and you know, as we all know, God God puts us there sometimes, whenever, and He's going to go with us. Two, um, ASP used to be in that the community in Huff Creek, and they haven't been there for ten years, and so we are the first ASP crew to be back in that area in ten years. We're also the first week of ASP for the summer, so I feel like. There's a reason God wanted us to go to West Virginia. I feel like the group that we were taking, 45 people from our community and from Casey's joining in with us is going to West Virginia. And I feel like God led us there because he knows the amazing people that are going with this trip. They know, he knows how much support has been for the, with, with us and for this trip throughout the year. We are, um, I told the kids and the adults, we're, we're pioneers for, for, for this week because they haven't, they haven't had us in their community ever from Illinois, and they haven't had us in ASP in 10 years, and so there's a lot can change in 10 years. So I feel like it's just a gift, and, and I'm thankful for that, that the maybe five to seven nudges that we got to go to West Virginia. <laughs> I'm glad God's persistent. But in the meantime, part of our 45 that are going with us are here today. So please stand if you're going to ASP this year with us. Hey. Okay, all right. Um, I asked people to stand in the first service um, and made everyone a little uncomfortable, so we'll go with a show of hands. Um, Raise your hand if you've heard of ASP. Okay, you all should hurt because it just all hurt. Okay, raise your hand if you helped with the rummage sale in any any sense of donating, working, um, buying. We raised over $7,000 through our rummage sale. That means, wow. The greatest part about that rummage sale is everyone comes together to put it together and then once it's over standing stone takes donations and it keeps giving to our community restore the habitat for humanity store comes and and takes what wasn't sold and it takes to their store and shares with our community and then the guild from the hospital came and got the books 
and so it continues to give and I feel like um, that's one of the greatest gifts of this trip is it just does, it's just not one week where we go it involves everyone we've had prayers we've had mm, financial support we we did a campaign in the fall to because we wanted a new trailer we wanted it outfitted we keep recreating the same trip over and over and and um, and we financial donations flowed in and then someone said here here's a trailer it's like oh well that was really amazing you know so now we have money and a trailer and we've just raised and people just come up to me every time what else can we do we've had people donate their cars we've had people donate money so we can rent car rent vans we've had it's just it's just an amazing experience and I feel honored and blessed to be a part of this group I feel like um Anyone who's been touched by AS ASP shares that message and, and blesses others because you can tell, you know, five years ago we had 10, this year we have 45. So the kids and adults that go on this trip are witnessing and, and sharing their testimony and just knowing that even though you can't physically go with us on this trip, that you are in our hearts and you are going with us to ASP. And we, we hold those prayers dearly because we need them. Um, we need them a lot because it's hard work and it's uncomfortable and it's a blessing and it's fun and so thank you thank you thank you for all of your support and there's more specific details in your bulletin but we just wanted to um, make sure everyone knew we were very grateful for your support thanks Tori well, before we go on I uh, let's let's just take a few moments to pray oh with one, one more announcement. Uh, next, uh, we, our summer music uh, uh, is underway, and um, the Second Sunday Singers uh, is a group that, you know, every second Sunday of each month through the summer, uh, those that want to sing at first service can gather at 8 a.m. and learn something just in the 30 minutes prior to the worship service, and then sing uh, in, in the, the anthem for the day um, at the first service second Sunday. So if any of you would love to be able to be a part of that, 8 o'clock uh, on the second Sunday through the summer, and lend your voice and your heart and, uh, and, and help us worship. Uh, before we uh, lift all of our voices together, uh, I want to invite us to a time of prayer. Gracious God, as we listen to the things that are going on in the life of Wesley, we're so grateful that you are at work in our midst. And we recognize, God, that it's your spirit that invites us to participate with what you are doing. And Lord, we thank you for the ASP trip and for the people that are going to go. We, we thank you for the students that have seen this as a, a neat opportunity. And we thank you for the adults that are giving of their time and, and their talents to, to make this a reality. Lord, we pray for everyone going on this trip we thank you for everyone who contributed to uh, financially and uh, through praying. And we pray that you would continue to go with them. And we pray for safety in travel. We pray for safety in the workplace. And we pray, God, that um, they would be a blessing to those who are receiving their care. And we thank you for the immense privilege it is to serve you. Uh, we also pray for uh, the ministries that reach the shut-ins of this church and ask your blessing to be upon it uh, lord as as people receive uh, prayer squares and and prayer shawls that they're reminded that there is a church here that loves them very much uh, and that you love them very much and lord we pray for those who are hurting today we pray for those who are in need of healing god that you would stretch out your healing arm over each one and restore health we pray all this in the strong name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Now, we're going to try something a little different today. We're not having a children's moment uh, per se, uh, but children's church is still going to be happening. But uh, we're going to sing uh, three choruses kind of back to back, uh, just as a way of uh, worshiping the God who is here. So on the last time, uh, it'll be majesty. Uh, on majesty, if the children that want to go to children's church, they can follow uh, Cindy Ebinger out and, and uh, they'll go to Children's Church as normal. Uh, but can we just sing uh, and, and worship?
there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after stand as we sing this. people of God say, amen. Please be seated. Well, I want to invite our ushers to prepare to receive the morning offering. You know, every week we have an opportunity uh, to worship God through the bringing of our tithes, gifts, and offerings. And, and really, this is an act of worship uh, because we recognize that God's blessed us so, and, and it's such a gift to be able to pass that blessing on. So if you're new here, um, this isn't your home church, please don't feel any obligation can let the plate go right on by. Uh, but for those of us that call this our church home, it's really uh, our way of empowering ministry in and through Wesley. So may God bless you as we bring our tithes, gifts, and offerings to God.
Gracious God, thank you for entrusting us to be stewards of what is yours. We pray that you'd receive these gifts and use them to be a blessing to others. And as we turn to your word, we pray, God, that you would draw us near to yourself. Teach us more of who you are and who you're calling us to be as followers of Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Please be seated. So the series that we're starting today is called Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Again, I think that it sometimes is a, a healthy thing when we're looking at a problem to look at the problem through a different lens. You know, if you look at discipleship through the lens of baseball, you'll pick up some things that you don't see in other places, you know, just trying to look at it. Sometimes we look at a problem for so long in, in so much the same ways we just can't see beyond it. And so using different lenses can, you know, help us. And after all, it's not a big stretch to use baseball. I mean, after all, it's in the Bible, right? It starts out in the beginning. All right, yeah, that's, it, doesn't get, it doesn't get much better than that. But um, uh, so are there any baseball lovers here? Do any of you just love the game? Yeah, all right. A double-handed lift. I like that, Mark. Uh, all right, so on the count of three, um, just kind of shout out your favorite team. One, two, three. <laughs> Why did I know that it was going to be uh, those? Yeah. Uh, quite a few. How, any others? Red Sox. Oh, okay. Well, more than a few baseball fans here today. And, and summer is a good time for baseball, right? I mean, we're just kind of kicking it in and and uh, starting to watch the games, starting to go to the games. And, and summer is just kind of a relaxing time, and sometimes we have the, the ability to take in uh, a baseball game. In 1999, baseball lost an interesting player. His name was Eddie Stanky. Do any of you know this name, Eddie Stanky? A few of you do. Um, you may not. I, you know, I wasn't super familiar with Eddie Stanky's history, but according to Time Magazine, Eddie Stanky was a pugnacious pennant-winning sec second baseman. Uh, pugnacious, I mean, he was just kind of in-your-face, go-getter, that kind of guy. Uh, his nickname was The Brat. He battled his way through 11 seasons. Um, he played for the Cubs, for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Boston Braves, the New York Giants, and the Cardinals. And here's what's interesting about Eddie Stanky. Uh, Branch Rickey, the Dodgers general manager, said of this, of this, of Stanky, he said, this guy can't run, he can't hit, and he can't even throw. But if there's a way to beat the other team, he'll find it. Now, isn't this kind of an interesting statement to make about a baseball player? Because, you know, I'm no expert on the game, but I'm pretty much guessing that if you can't throw well, and you can't run well, and you can't hit well, those are probably some big three in baseball to be able to pull off. So what was it about Eddie Stanky that made him, um, you know, such a good player? And, and why did teams want him? Uh, I, I think what you'll discover is you may have more in common with Eddie Stanky uh, than you may know. But we'll come back to that. For right now, let me just talk for a minute about why this, why this is important, what we're looking at today. Because if you've ever felt like doing something significant for God, but you didn't know what to do or how to do it. Have any of you ever been there? You want to do something for, that, that'll make a difference in the kingdom of heaven. You want to do something for God, but you don't really know where to start or how to do it. And if you've ever been there, that's kind of a frustrating feeling. You want to engage. You want to do something. You want to allow God to use you. You just don't know where to start. And if that's you, then I hope you're encouraged by this message today. And another person that might um, relate to this is if you've ever felt like you had nothing to bring to the table for God to use. Man, I have been there more times than I can count. God, I don't have what it takes to do what you're calling me to do. And if you've ever been there, I hope you're encouraged by what you discover in the scriptures today. And here's why. Because how you see yourself will affect how you give of yourself. Does that make sense? How you see yourself 
affects how you give of yourself. Story about a little boy, you know, in a sand lot, and, and he was going through the, in the backyard, and he had his little ball bat and his ball, and he was all ready to go, you know. And this little guy, you know, they over, people overheard him in the backyard, and he'd, he'd say, I'm the greatest hitter ever. And he took his ball, and he threw it up, and he whiffed, and he missed it, and the ball just dropped right at his feet. And undaunted, he yells, Steerike one, you know, he calls it on himself. And then he picks up the ball, and he throws it up, and he whiffs again. Ball drops. It's a little bit deflated at this point. Strike two. And he picks up the ball, and he looks at the ball, and he picks up the bat, makes sure that it's all together and, and doing what it's supposed to do. You know, spits in his hand. I'm the greatest batter ever. And he throws the ball up and whiffs again. Strike three. But then his countenance changed. And he said, I'm the greatest pitcher ever. How you see yourself will affect how you give of yourself. And I don't know how you see yourself when it comes to being used by God. But I do know that how we view ourselves affects us greatly. Stephen Dooley Jr. once said, whoever wants to do something will find a way. Whoever doesn't will find an excuse. <laughs> can you relate to that? Boy, I can. If we want to do something, we'll find a way. But if we don't want to do something, we're pretty good at finding excuses as to all the reasons that we can't do it. And maybe you've been there in church. Maybe you feel like God's calling you to do something and you can find every excuse in the book as to why you're not the person to pull that off. And if that is you, you're not alone. Um, there's actually a story in Scripture that you heard Maria reading earlier. You know, it's the story of Moses. And, and this is perhaps a more familiar story of Moses talking to God through a burning bush. But I know that sometimes our, the stories from Scripture, they can get so familiar that we quickly go, oh yeah, I know what that's about, and then we dismiss it and move on. And we miss sometimes some of the finer points of these stories. Do you remember this story? God speaking to Moses, and God says to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people, and I've seen their misery, and I'm concerned about them, Moses. And so... Moses, I want you to be the one to go to Pharaoh because I care about what these people of mine are going through. And Moses goes, who am I? God, who am I to do what you're describing? What you're describing is an enormous size task. Who am I to pull off this enormous sized task? And God gets it. God says, I get it. I'll be with you, Moses. I will be with you, Moses. The God of the universe talking to you through a burning bush. I'll be with you. You would think that that might settle it, but no. Moses says, well, suppose they demand a name. Suppose they ask me who it is that's sending me. What do I tell them? And God says, well, tell them that I am sent you. And Moses says, well, what if they don't listen? And this is moving into chapter 4 of, of Exodus. Uh, and Moses goes, what if they don't listen to me? And God says, well, what is that in your hand? And Moses says, it's a staff. And God says, well, throw it down. So Moses throws the staff down. The staff turns into a serpent. It says that Moses kind of ran away. I would too. I'm not a big snake fan personally. Uh, but the staff turns into a snake and starts crawling around. And Moses is like, mm, I'm out of here. God says, okay, grab it by the tail. Moses grabs it by the tail. It turns back into a staff. And you would think at this point that that would kind of seal the deal. God says, Moses, take your hand and put it in your cloak. And Moses puts his hand in his cloak. And when he pulls it out, it's full of leprosy. It's just leprous. And God says, put it in your cloak again. And so Moses puts it back into his cloak. And when he pulls it out again, it's restored. God's trying to let Moses know, I'm going to be with you, Moses, as you do this. Moses, undaunted, still reaching for every excuse he can find, says, well, God, I can't talk very well. 
And God says, well, who do you think gave you that mouth, Moses? I will help you. And Moses, finally, running out of excuses, says, send someone else. He runs out of every possible excuse he can come up with, so he just finally just comes out with it. Send somebody else, God. And God finally gets Aaron to go with Moses. But notice in this story that God does not remove the call that he has placed on Moses' life. He tells Moses, Aaron's going to speak to, you, to, to Pharaoh for you, but you are going to speak to Aaron. You will fulfill what, the call that I've placed on you, Moses. And you'll be able to fulfill it because I'm going to enable you to fulfill it. So even though Moses is trying to run away from the call of God on his life, God is trying to provide every way possible so Moses can live into the call that God has for him. Moses grasping at straws to get out of it. But God is consistently trying to encourage and assure Moses and to remind Moses that he's not doing this alone. He's trying to empower Moses to do this and to reassure him in the process. But Moses can't hear it. And I wonder if you and I ever get there where God is trying to remind us that he's with us. Mission trips are a great place to be reminded, <laughs> right? When you get to that job and you feel like, I can't do this, and all of a sudden, God brings Warren Ebinger to come up alongside you and help you get done the thing that you need to get done. I mean, it's remarkable. When we, when we feel like we cannot do something, and God reassures us that we're not alone, and it's not all on us. I don't know about you, but sometimes... You know, in my life, I, as I look back, I know there have been times when I would think, you know, I'll come up with some excuses as to why I shouldn't do this. And we, we find them in other areas, too. We find all sorts of reasons. We say things like, you know, I'm just too busy, or I've already done my part. You know, like 40 years ago, I did that, and, and I, I, I'm good now because I'm done. Let's let someone else do it. You know, that's not my gift. We're, we're good at saying that. But you know what? Maybe God calls us all through our lives. Maybe God has different calls upon our lives, even in the, over the duration of our lives. So the question, the burning question is, what is God calling you to do? How is God calling you to engage? How is God equipping you to participate in kingdom building ventures with Him? even now, as he invites you to step up to the plate. The scriptures are replete with God looking for people who will step up to the plate and just take a swing. They don't have to be the best and the brightest. They don't, you know, Eddie Stanky uh, found a, a profession in baseball, even though he couldn't hit well, throw well, or run well, but he found his niche in baseball. God doesn't always go for the brightest and the best. He's just looking for the availability of his people. And I think sometimes we confuse it and we think that God's looking for abilities and we're quick to dismiss our inability. But God is not looking just for our abilities. God's looking for our availability, our willingness to step up to the plate and take a swing. One thing I know is that if I don't step up to the plate, I will never get a hit. It's just the way it is, isn't it? I'll never get a hit unless I step up to the plate. So let me just take a little poll here for a moment. And, and, and this is like guilt-free zone, okay? Declared guilt-free, no judge area, okay? How many of you here would not be comfortable singing a, a special solo during worship? How many of you would say that? I'm not comfortable doing that. Okay, several hands. What about, um, uh, you, you would not be comfortable playing, or you don't play an instrument, any instrument at all. Don't play it. Yep, more hands. Okay, what about, how many of you don't know enough about sound gear to work back in the sound booth? 
Still more hands, okay. Um, how many of you wouldn't be comfortable teaching a Sunday school class? Okay, yeah, a few fence riders there. Uh, what about praying in public? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's a big one for some. Yeah, right. All right, so you just confessed, all of us together, right, that we wouldn't feel comfortable doing a lot of things. How easy would it be just to dismiss ourselves from any service because we, didn't, we don't do what we just named? The truth is all of us could answer, raise our hands on more, any, any or all of those. But again, don't minimize the impact that you can have on the church when God places a call in your life. Do you know that you already have a passion and talents and abilities? God gave you those. The things that you're passionate about, you're passionate about them because God put that passion within you. The spheres of influence that you have, they're there because they're your spheres of influence and, and you have the ability to speak into those lives. The talents and the abilities that you have, you have because God's given them to you for a purpose. And you can use those talents and gifts and abilities to bring glory to God and to contribute to the kingdom of heaven. Again, here's Eddie Stanky, who by all, uh, by all indicators is not going to make a great ball player. But he had this uncanny ability to exploit the weakness of the other team. He always knew how to win. Leo DeRocher said, you know, he can't do all those things. All he can do is win. He just had a knack for it. And that's the niche that he found in baseball. Jesus isn't looking for someone with talent so much as he's looking for someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to make a difference and to contribute to the kingdom of heaven, to participate in the kingdom of heaven, to make a difference in this world around us. You know, there is an I in team, right? We, all, we, we tell our kids, we, we, you know, there's no I in team, there's no I in team, and we drill that into their heads. But there is an I in team, isn't there? You know, for me, this came um, vivid. Was I, I remember this young boy, Gene and I were going to go to a concert at a high school someplace, and there was a young seventh grade boy who was involved in like peewee football, you know? And his mother was there, and they were talking about the practice that they were having. And, and I think I asked the question, you know, how's, how's it going or something like that. And um, then the mom asked a couple of follow-up questions, you know, prompting him to answer. And, and uh, he said, well, I was out there today, but, you know, nobody on the team is giving any effort at all. So I decided that I'm not going to give any effort. If they're not going to give any effort, then I'm not giving any effort. I'm not going to do anything. And as I'm sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, this is the I in team. You cannot control what the other team members are going to do, whether they give or they don't give. What you can control is if you show up. There is an I in team. It's, it's the decision that you and I make to show up and be available and to utilize the gifts and the talents that God's given us to make a difference around us. You, you decide to show up to your job, even if everyone else is slacking off you don't have to, right? That's the I in team. And whenever we show up to God, we, we could pick any number of a variety of, of excuses. They're all great. But what God's looking for is someone who will step up to the plate. One of the most profound passages to me in this whole thing is in chapter 4, verse 2. When God says to Mo Moses, is saying, I don't want to do it. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I'm not the one to do it. You know, and God finally says, Moses, what is that in your hand? It's my staff. Moses already had what he needed for God to use. God makes a special point to point out, don't forget the staff, Moses. Moses already had the staff. He already had what he needed to be used by God. And so the inference for us is that you already have 
what you need to be used by God to make a difference in this world. To love someone indiscriminately. To forgive someone recklessly. To bless someone abundantly. You already have what you need. God's already given it to you. What God is looking for is those of us who are willing to step up to the plate and just take a swing. Tommy Lasorda put it this way. No matter how good we are, we're going to lose one-third of our games. No matter how bad we are, we're going to win a third of our games. So what really comes to bear is the last third. If we're going to win and lose a third of our games, then it's really the final third that makes all the difference. What is it that's in your hand already? What is it that God wants to use to bless others through you? It's a great prayer to pray. Let's pray. Gracious God, when we read your scripture, we're reminded that you hear the cries of your people. You see the misery of your people. And you care deeply. And your desire is to bring us alongside. To minister. To respond. That we might bless others the way that you have blessed us. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have come alongside us. And we pray that you would continue to give us grace to step up to the plate. Not to worry about whether or not we get a hit. Just give us grace to swing. Lead us and guide us that we might serve you. We pray all this with anticipation that the kingdom of heaven would be glorified. In Christ's name, amen. You know, it's coming to this table of grace that we're reminded it's not all about us. It's not all on us. God offers to empower us to live for Him. And so we remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, and we remember um, how in Luke's Gospel, Luke says, Jesus looked at His close friends and He said to them, I have longed to share this meal with you. And Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks for it, which he did at every meal. But this time, when he broke the bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So take and eat, all of you, and as often as you eat this bread, remember me. And when that supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. So take and drink, all of you, and as often as you drink it. Remember me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we're participating in the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And, and the body reminds us of everything that Jesus did while he was on this earth. And the, and the cup, the blood, reminds us of the spirit that filled Jesus to do those acts of love while on this earth. So in essence, when we participate in communion, we're inviting those things to be part of our lives for God to do a transformational work inside us so that our actions look more like Christ every day. So God, would you pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until that great and glorious day when we feast at your heavenly banquet. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to invite those that are going to help serve uh, communion today to come forward and uh, begin to receive the elements yourselves. And as they're coming forward, um, let me just offer a, a word about how we celebrate communion here at Wesley. Uh, we understand this not to be a United Methodist table, but the Lord's table. And all are welcome at the Lord's table. So please know 
that you are welcome to receive communion here today um, be, because of that. If you come from another denomination uh, that does not permit you to celebrate communion in other churches, if you just come to where I am, uh, just come and cross your arms in front of you. I, I'll, pr I'll pray a blessing over you. I'm happy to do that. Uh, also, we have gluten-free stations set up over here. We'll also have a normal or a regular, if you will, regular bread and a regular cup, uh, people standing on the far left, my far left. Uh, but if you require um, gluten-free or would like to use gluten-free with a dedicated goblet, that's there on that glass top table. So use that aisle if you want gluten-free elements. Um, and uh, just come as you're led. If for some reason, because of physical limitations, you can't come forward, if the ushers would help us to see you or just raise your hand, let us um, know that you're there. We'll be happy to bring uh, the elements to you. But please know that this is God's gift offered to you freely. Um, and uh, if you come down the aisle closest to the center and go back on the other side, I think we'll, that, that should be good. But come as you're led.
Gracious God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. So we pray that even as these physical elements become part of our physical bodies, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would nourish our souls that we might continue to be made more like Christ by your strength, by your grace, by your power. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to stand as we close and as a declaration of our intention to step up to the plate, I thought maybe we'd close by singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Would you sing with me? Every day is a gift, and every day is an opportunity to offer our availability to God for God to use. So may God provide you opportunities this week to be used by Him, and may God give you the grace equal to every need, that as God continues to bless you and equip you, you allow that grace and blessing to flow to those around you. In the name of our risen Savior Christ, amen. Have a great week.